So you want to feel old, Chris? Sure. So I started watching G4 the June 2005. And okay. you want to know what age I was? How old? 10. 10 years old. You're you're an attack of the show baby. You're a G4 baby. Yeah, that's and crazy. I, and you know, my flavor was more X play than anything, but mm -hmm. I would still tune in every, you know, every so often to be like, hey, what's what's uh, Kevin up to? What's Olivia up? Hello, Chris. Wow, I just completely lost words. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> good to uh, meet you, Austin. Good to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you. We're he I'm here today with Chris Gore. This is one of. Um, I apologize to future people who are watching this back because. This has got to be one of the most exciting interviews I've done um, wow. because those who know me know I grew up on G4, Attack of the Show, X-Play, and that's actually kind of what developed my whole criticism brain and what kind of got me into writing, really. So thank you for having the time to join me, your, your documentary, which, you know, you're you wrote it, you directed it, you produced it. I think Film Threat is, correct me if I'm wrong, distributing it as well. Well, yeah, it's uh, Film Threat and Indie Rights is putting it out. So it's, uh, there are many producers, producing partners, Dual Animal Studios. But, you know, I'm like you, like, look, I'm, I was a fan of the show who ended up being on the show. So sort of, I had one foot in, one foot out, um, when I got the call to like, hey, would you like to be on the show weekly doing a segment called DV Tuesday talking about film? And I was like, this was, I was going to be on the show, The Screensavers. Yeah. And I yeah. loved The Screensavers. Leo Laporte, Sarah Lane. I loved it. I could not, I could not wait to, like, I watched that show. I watched X-Play. I watched The Screensavers. I thought, oh my God, look, there's a TV network that's all for nerds. I'm a nerd. Because yeah. like you, I don't know how many long boxes of comics you have. I don't know what your DVD collection is like. But boy, um, when I was a kid, I collected comics. I made Aurora model kits. I had a newspaper route where I just used all my money to just buy nerdy stuff that I wanted. And, um, you know, I, uh, I, I just am a lifelong nerd going to comic book conventions. When I was a kid, I dressed up as Spock and went to see Leonard Nimoy at the Detroit Auto Show. They'd have this little side thing with like, this is when being a nerd, you would be, you know, bullied and teased as a kid. Now nerd culture is kind of cool, but even when G4 launched, nerd culture was still not cool. There were definitely yeah. nerd culture existed, but it wasn't cool yet. But when I got this call from Gavin Purcell, like, would you like to be on uh, the screensavers? I said, I would love, are, are you kidding? I watched the show. And I told him, I said, I have three, three things that I would like. I said, one, I want to be able to wear whatever I want, you know, like a film threat t-shirt. I want to be able to say whatever I want within reason. I'm not going to swear, but my opinion is my opinion. Although I found out later that I could mispronounce swear words. Excuse me, I could literally, oh, I could say something like that guy was a total shithid. <laughs> then I said, well, I want to be able I want to be able to keep all the DVDs that I review. And he said, well, I can agree to the first two, but the last one, um, you're just, we keep them in our producer's library, which I found out later. Yeah. Well, I found out later that was producers stealing DVDs to take home. Oh, okay. So, yeah. uh, which was funny, but, um, Look, it was, you know, me being on Attack of the Show was the best experience I ever had in, in television. I had since kind of given up on doing TV. I didn't really like it. I was a big nerd, but, you know, being on Attack of the Show was the first time I was able to be myself on camera, just authentically me. And that was the first time I could do that. The previous television I did, they tried to hip me up and make me cool. Uh... And as, you know, much as you think I'm cool, uh, look at my room. I'm surrounded with all this nerdy stuff. Yeah, I'm Kenner the toy back nerd. there. Yeah, oh, I've got just a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's a George Lucas action figure. Uh, oh, there's a oh. reprint of issue 27 of Detective Comics, the first appearance of Batman. That's a reprint. 
Um, an R2-D2 over here that's a cooler that actually is a cooler. You can fill it with uh, your favorite beverage, keeps it cool. So yeah, it's just, I'm surrounded with, you haven't, the room is just insane with nerdy stuff. But like, that's an audience. That's that's a type of person. And, and I was really just proud to be a part of that show, even though it was like a small part. I was on like once or twice a week. And then I was the backup host. I was kind of like Chekhov. If everyone was off the bridge, then Chekhov would be able to sit in the captain's chair. But it wasn't until everyone was unavailable. Um, so I was a I was on call if needed. But look, it was my best experience in TV. And what I began to notice when I would go to Comic Cons, I got this question constantly. Whatever happened to G4 TV? What happened to Attack of the Show? What happened to it? And I thought maybe someone should make a documentary about it. And I popped into my head the name Attack of the Dock. Well, a documentary about Attack of the Show just should just be called Attack of the Dock. So I registered the website attackofthedock.com. I grabbed the social handles, Attack of the Dock. Nobody had it. And uh, I thought, well, I'll make the documentary. I'll make it. I'll kind of ease you in because I'm a fan and I was on the show, tell the story and then kind of bookend, right? So um, that's kind of how it evolved. We did this Kickstarter. The initial one didn't succeed. The second one did. And then it's that sense of relief. Oh my gosh, I did a successful Kickstarter. And then, uh-oh, I have to actually make the doc. So uh, that, you know, then it's like, all right, let's go. Here's the plan. And then the when we first started shooting, we started shooting in March of 2020 and you know what happened? Yeah. The pandemic. And so that kind of changed how we made the doc. We decided we would go a different way. We would make an archival documentary and all of the interviews were done like this, like white, like you interviewing me right now. That's how I did all the interviews. And I used the audio from the interviews and then, um, you know, ran that over footage. So that's that's the sort of process we came up with. It's not original. Other people have made documentaries that way, yeah. uh, just using audio. But uh, that's kind of how the doc was made. But it was truly my best experience in television and having worked with Kevin and Olivia was, uh, you know, w one of the greatest joys of my life. It was awesome. Yeah, and, you know, I think you bring a unique perspective having, you know, been part of G4 that you get to see a lot of i think i don't know if this had been released before but a lot of the archival footage you show is either kevin Pereira walking around the attack of the show set just pointing out random things or uh one time you're in the control room and it's just like I've... this is stuff fans haven't seen before which has been really you know it's almost like peeking behind the curtain a little bit yeah, that was the intention, was one of the um, guys who was the technical director, his name is Christopher Flynn, he shot a little BTS footage behind the scenes of, you know, Attack of the Show and what was happening and, and whatnot. And, um, you know, uh, not just that, we scoured the internet. We had a library of footage that was hundreds of hours of footage from Attack of the Show that we found on Reddit forums and YouTube channels where YouTubers just wanted to archive it. You know, our, we looked at archive.org. Um, I had even personal footage that I shot, you know, on a hard drive and and video and 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 photos and whatnot. So it was like, we spent the first year of making this movie was just organizing all of the archives and then that, coming... Yeah. Oh, it was, it was, it was crazy. Josiah Teal, who was a guy who was, if we needed a clip, we always went to him and all of us had day jobs. So we're working on this movie, right? But all of us had like jobs to work on other stuff. So it's just like, it was like, that's another reason why it took so long. It's like, well, we got to make money to live. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're going to make the best doc we can under the circumstances. So creating the archive and finding the footage initially was the first 
hurdle to get over. It was a challenge, but it was it was also fun because everyone, everyone who worked on this movie is a G4 and Attack of the Show super fan. Like, like Bobby Schwartz, who is the producer with me and the editor, Walter Arreas, also a producer, Anthony Ray Bench, Phil Eubanks, Glenn Brown, editors, uh, you know, um, Josiah Teal also like, they used to watch Attack of the Show when they were in junior high, way back when in like the early 2000s. So now suddenly they're grown up and it's just like, God, I met Bobby Schwartz at like a bar in Hollywood. And it was like randomly. It was like, oh, and then we just had this huge conversation about movies. We sat there and we're kicking back margaritas. Um, I think I ordered two on accident and it's just like, ah, oh, cool. Just give it to this guy. And then we just became fast friends. And, uh, you know, it's weird. Just like, that's why I think the doc, I hope it comes off as a love letter because that was the intention. I mean, there's some drama that's in the doc, but it's not anything that's gossipy or, you yeah. know, yeah. it's it's really a love letter to not just Attack of the Show in G4, but that era, that time period, you know, when things were maybe a little more simple, you know? Yeah. So, and in, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it even gets into uh, some of the stuff a little bit. I won't spoil a, a, a lot of it because I think there's some interesting insights to be had, but it gets into a little bit on the backdoor uh, meetings uh, when uh, Comcast was turning G4 into, I think it was Esquire Network. Yeah. I think it was. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, you, and there's a, I think it was an animation you show or something like that of three yeah. boards g4 e <laughs> and style yeah um and that was how you could track okay how are we doing and then just one day g4 blank yeah and you know it it was interesting to get that insight because following that period of G4 where it was kind of just out of nowhere shut down and it was like oh hey we're gonna have this new thing called Esquire Network and I almost wish more docs were popping up about G4 because I would love that to hear more about that period because it just seems kind of like a weird time and I'm sure it was weird from your yeah. perspective too. Well, I'd always intended for the documentary to be 90 minutes. I mean, it's hard enough to keep people's attention span. So trying to fit that much history, 20 years of history from April 24th, 2002, which was when G4 TV originally launched to, you know, bringing it up to the present, 20 plus years of history was a lot to put in a doc. But if you get the Blu-ray, because see the 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 video on demand version of Attack of the Doc, you can rent or buy on April 24th, the 21st anniversary of the launch of G4 TV. In July, right before San Diego Comic-Con, and I'll be at San Diego Comic-Con, we're going to be releasing a Blu-ray of uh, Attack of the Doc with just what you asked for, the unedited interviews with the more than 20 people I interviewed in the doc, it's 20 hours. We're calling it kind of a podcast. So everyone that you saw interviewed in the doc, you know, maybe they talk for like a minute or 30 seconds, 20 hours of interviews um, will be on the Blu-ray in audio form, plus behind the scenes, Easter eggs. The animation that you saw was done in Second Life, that kind of machinima, which was... Of I was going to ask about that. Yeah, so I know the people who own Second Life, and I said, hey, could we recreate the old set of Attack of the Show in Second Life? And they're like, yeah, we can do that. So they built the set of Attack of the Show in Second Life. When you buy the Blu-ray, one of the Easter eggs is, you can click on it and go to the set in Second Life. You literally, physically, you create your avatar unless you already have a Second Life account. And it's free. Just sign up Second Life. Um, 
create your avatar. It can look just exactly like you, or you can look like something else. And you can go to the set. It's a secret link. You can go to the set of Attack of the Show. You can stand at the podium that Kevin and Olivia stood at. You can walk around the studio. We did an exact replication of the set. So uh, that's only on the Blu-ray. It's an Easter egg. So you'll be able to find it. So yeah. there's a lot of Easter eggs. There's so many Easter eggs. I can't wait for people to like, there are so many Easter eggs. It's going to take months and I'm not, I, you know what? Hopefully you find them. There are 13 Easter eggs on the disc, but there are other Easter eggs that are actually in the movie. There are Easter eggs. Interesting. So Any... I don't want to give up what they are. Has It's not, it's not out yet, but yeah, but um, the Blu-ray will have exactly what you asked for. You want more details on that? You've got the people firsthand telling you stories. They're very long. What we did with the doc was, the doc is like the greatest hits, right? So it's like we condensed all those stories so that the story would move quickly. But if you really want deep dive, and podcast is the best way to do a deep dive. It just is. It's a better, podcasting is the best format for two, three hour conversations. And um, the Blu-ray, it's all on that. So there you go. That's awesome. I, and I was kind of wondering, not to spoil something that happens during the credits. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I was like, wait. There's an end credit. There's an end credit right? scene. There's an end credit yes. scene. That's like a, a like. It's, I love those end credit scenes in movies. So I, this was totally from the beginning. Like this is the end credit scene. This is going to be the last thing you see. Even the the credits are really long, but it's by design. I wanted every single name of every backer alpha, alphabetical by first name in the doc. And yeah, it's in I the was doc. Just like, I was just like, wait, these are all backers. Holy cow. Yeah, it's a lot. It's 1,100 people. So they're all in there. And But also it's like, well, if you want to watch the credits, you can, because there's stuff that's happening during the credits that's kind of fun. And yeah. so it's not, I mean, you can leave the credits. Uh, if you see it in the theater, go ahead, go to the bathroom, whatever, come back. But um, if you stay through the credits, you will always be rewarded. I don't think I'll ever make a movie that doesn't have a post credit scene. It's not like Marvel invented it. It's happened in many other movies, but Marvel kind of perfected it. And they, the, you know, a mid credit scene and they've had like three credit scenes. Hey, you know what? I love it. Uh, as a movie nerd, you know, do it. The more the merrier. So there you, you know go. what the uh, credit sequence reminded me of, and this what? is gonna di th this is gonna put it, put out how young I am. Um, That's okay. It, it reminds me of the blooper reels Pixar used to do for their for their animated movies. Yes, like especially yeah. Toy Story two, specifically. Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, the bloopers, I like when there's like, or Jackie Chan movies, yeah. where Jackie yeah. Chan, you'll see the bloopers and stunts gone wrong. Like, I love, because I like to watch the credits. I want to see the credits. I want to see like, oh, is there anyone I recognize? Or I didn't know who the cinematographer was. I want to see who that is. Like, oh, there's a producer name. I recognize that. They've done other movies similar. I'll check out. Or I, I, I love credits for movies. You, you know, little things that people will sneak in, like, um, you know, and and look, even some parts of the credits are a little sentimental. We did shout outs to people who passed away since Attack of the Show ended. And there were babies born during Attack of the Show. I know of at least a couple couples that um, uh, met their significant other during Attack of the Show. So um, that's all acknowledged in the credits. And it's really like... I mean, for the people who used to work on Attack of the Show, it's going to be like uh, a yearbook. It's going to be like a video version of a yearbook. If you're a fan of Attack of the Show, it's kind of a love letter and a greatest hits. And if you've never heard of it, it'll give you insight into like, this is when comedy was a little bit dangerous. When, uh, you know, you could get away with a lot of stuff. I think that almost a lot of the stuff on Attack of the Show back then, almost every day there's something that's cancelable that somebody either yeah. said or did. And um, I'm glad that the show was able to be done without that burden, without the burden of the eyes of the judgment 
of people on social media who tisk tisk don't like you to do this. It's like, look, some stuff you can argue it's funny, it's raunchy, might have gone too far, but you know what? Tune in the next day because you never know what could happen. Yeah, it was Attack of the Show truly was that kind of show where you would tune in. I I I I, I think it was every Friday. No, it was Attack of the Show was every day. Something okay. they would do like Monday through Thursday. It's and then been a Friday while, was so like forgive a best me. Of show. Yeah, but it was a daily live show. Daily live. That is not easy to produce. Crazy. But uh, but yeah, man, it was. And then Friday, they would do a special like, comp- they used to do live shows on Fridays. Then they started doing, um, they started doing like a best of on Fridays because Kevin and Olivia would want like a three-day weekend or, you know, give us some time off, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it's, that the kind of energy to do a live show every day it's crazy i look back and i don't think that anybody working on the show knew how good they had it because a lot of the people that work behind the scenes it was their first job in television for me it was my really my last job in tv and the best time i ever had but i loved it it was i so much appreciated and was so grateful to be a part of it but a lot of the people there it was like their first tv job and it's like you don't know how good you have it this is so great you get to come up with crazy ideas in the morning, in the afternoon you film, and after it's live, it's done, and you go home. How awesome is that? It's, uh, uh, yeah, so it was a period of time probably not to be repeated, but I appreciate that you're a fan and and uh, remember remember it. Yeah, so. and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about this. One of my most potent memories about G4 was infamous VGX. The, the, what was it? The infamous VGX where uh, Joel McHale came on and totally. He, he just, you could tell he didn't want to be there. Yes, he, that's true. He shot his show down the hall. Okay. So, so it was like in the same studio, but like down the hall, he had a different, well, actually across the hall. So yeah, that's where he Too shoot fair, yeah. his, his yeah. thing. But like, yeah, it was weird because we were in the same studio as E. So it was like E, um, G4, and then the Style Network. And it was so weird, the behind the scenes, because G4, it was kind of like, it was almost like high school, okay? So G4 were all the nerds. Video game nerds, movie nerds, comic book nerds tech nerds and then you'd see the style network and the people from e and they were incredibly well dressed very stylish they all like were like cool um and we were like the glasses nerds whatever so there was a a clear difference when you looked at the offices for the people who worked on e or the style network and then you looked at the people that worked at g4 very, very different people. So um, they must have been in a bind and had, I don't remember that episode, but I do remember that Joel McHale had, uh, I really love his sense of humor. So I, I happen to like him, but um, yeah, he was great. He shot his show like across the hall. You know, there it was, um, the uh, the opposite studio. But yeah, it was it was a very, very different time. For sure, but it was interesting to see that sort of like oil and vinegar, oil and water. They just didn't mix the G four yeah. folks and the the Style Network and the E people were definitely very very separate. You could tell just by looking where someone worked, right? Because the Style Network people were very, you know, no surprise, they were very stylish. They were very like they dressed to the nines. And the G four folks, it was like, what Batman T shirt are you wearing today? You know, that's just. You know, there you go. Here, I, I got a long box full of 150 comics I bought today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, that's still me. So yeah. there you are. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, G4 got revived um, mm-hmm. recently. I I, I want to say back in uh, 2021 was when they launched. I believe it was November of 2021. That, is yeah, when the network relaunched. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask really quick, how did you feel about that relaunch? I, I know you get into it a little bit in the doc, but I just thought I'd ask, you know, it, it's been a few months. I think they shut down in October of last year. 
Yes. Um, I, I guess what was your what was your hopes for that network now that it was free from the shackles of cable? Well, my hope was that it would have been a huge success and people would have would have really embraced it. I think part of the problem was part of the problem was the legacy of the old network and what people loved about the old network wasn't what the new network was. The second thing, so those expectations, yeah, I think the expectation was they're putting the band back together. Kevin and yeah. Olivia are going to come back. And Morgan and Adam are going to come back, and that didn't happen. And they brought on a lot of really good new people. They brought on to the network. And so my hope was it was going to be kind of a little bit like the old stuff, but you got to bring in a new generation. You know, look, I'm aged out of the demo. It's fine. I have my own YouTube channel, Film Threat. But, um, you know, look, I wanted it to succeed. I have friends who work there. I wanted it to succeed. I think the problem was, um, and not in a bad way, I think that they coming back in an era on YouTube when any uh, creator can just be an authentic person, get a million subscribers, and get hundreds of thousands of views on their videos, it's a different period of time. You can't produce television the way you produce the old G4 in this era anymore. And I think that they had to kind of rethink that. I Look, I wanted it to be a huge success. And I think early on they were finding their footing and they were not. This is the thing that I, I am, I'm really upset about is they weren't given the chance to find their footing. The original G4 was not a hit. Yeah. The original G4 launched in on April 24, 2002. It was not a hit. It took years, and then they emerged with Tech TV, and then this. It took probably five years before you could say that G4 was a success. Five years. This new launch of the network was not even given a year to kind of find the voice, make mistakes. Uh, look, a lot of mistakes were made with the original G4 early on. People didn't know what they were doing. Things kind of, they threw stuff at the wall. Did this work? No, do a different show, do this. But they had that support to become successful. The new G4 did not have that support. And that's the thing I'm probably most upset about is they weren't given a chance to fail, um, to connect with the audience, to, you know, just you know, recover from mistakes, have some highs and some lows. And, uh, you know, they were, they, you know, coming back at a time when YouTube is really huge, I think is difficult. I think it's very difficult to do that. So the landscape is different. I think looking at what the nerd landscape is now is different than what it was um, in 2002. And when, you know, G4 kind of like rose at the same time as the mainstreaming of geek culture. Main, you know, geek culture is mainstream now. Now what? Yeah. And the new G4 needed to do something that YouTube couldn't do, could not do, and do it better than YouTube. So I just feel like they needed a couple of years to figure it out, and they could have. And, um, you know, I'm sad that it didn't, it, it, it did not succeed in the long run, but I hope that people through this documentary remember the legacy of G4 TV, the legacy of Attack of the Show, and its place in pop culture history as a, as a milestone. Yeah, and to give my own thoughts, because this will probably be the only time I ever say something about it, uh, unless X Play or X Play or G4 come back for a third time. Um, <laughs> right. We'll, we'll could be, happen. We'll, could happen. Uh, maybe yeah. as like a Patreon, kind of like a Easy Allies when they move from game trailers or uh, min max when they move from game and former but uh anyways i feel like it happened pretty similar to similarly to where i, I forget the name of it but when sessler and a bunch of other g4 folks came on to i, I forget it was but it was run by discovery it, it was some internet network run by discovery that was given like a bunch of funding i think they also had like other outlets like Destructoid revitalized for for the for like some kind of multi-channel network on YouTube. I feel like it enough, too much money was maybe involved to give it the success and maybe and I think this is what they should have done. I, I mean, I'm speaking like I know what I'm doing. 
but um <laughs> right 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 um, but I, I i would really have loved to have seen you know when they announced um, um the return of g4 at that thanksgiving episode i i i think it would have been really beneficial to them to say hey we've got no external funding you fund what we want to make you know do you want us to do twitch streams you know bring the fans into that because right. What I've found is the the outlets, if you want to even call them that anymore, I feel like outlets has kind of become a vague term now when you've got a YouTube channel and a thousand different ways to connect with your audience, as I'm sure you're aware. Right. That I think it's become critical now that you just have a one-on-one -on -one dialogue to be like, hey, what do you want to do? What do you want us to do? And I don't think they were asking that question enough. I think they were just like, hey, here's what we're going to do. And then they did it. And then they were surprised. Oh, hey, this isn't working. And there was a lot yeah, of there backlash. Was, that's a, first of all, that. Sorry to interrupt you, Austin. Sorry about that. I, I think you are, you hit the nail on the head. You hit the nail on the head. The thing that was probably missing was the feedback loop. And the feedback loop is your audience telling you what they like and also what they don't like. And you should be responsive to that. You know, you have to be responsive to the feedback loop. Sometimes some of the things that are said, look, I've had some incredibly unkind things said about me on the internet. And usually I, Same. usually I just respond with humor. Look, there's a comment. If you go to the attack of the doc YouTube channel where the trailer is posted and and someone posted a thing says, oh, I find Chris Gore so annoying. And I'm and I replied and I said, oh, I, I agree with you. I'm with myself 24 <laughs> seven. You know, I just like I responded with a joke. And and it's like, look, and then I got in a whole conversation with the guy. We were laughing and, you know, talking and whatever. It's just like, look, you have to have a sense of humor about yourself. You have to listen to the audience when they tell you what they want. You have to be a, a be sort of to me be an example of how to handle certain situations where you know like look it's not polite to talk to people this way don't don't amplify trolls and people that use hurtful language ignore them they'll go away because they'll get bored they eventually yeah. get bored if they don't if they don't get a reaction out of you and if they know they're getting a reaction out of you they will not go away so I think it's really important. I think it's really important to listen to your audience. You know, I built my own YouTube channel film thread and it's, you know, it's not the biggest audience, but you know, we get like 500, a thousand people watching us live. We get, you know, we've, we're closing in on a hundred thousand subscribers on Congrats. YouTube and that's res respectable. So um, I've got a niche audience. I talk about nerdy movie stuff, super nerdy, no surprise. Um, <laughs> but you know, um, it's, uh, I do think the feedback loop is important and I think being able to pivot quickly and they have like in business. And I know this just from having relaunched film threat. I relaunched film threat in 2017 as a website and a YouTube channel. And you need to have what they call the burn rate, right? Your burn rate is how much money you're spending. You know, you cannot be spending more money than is coming in. You've got to get that, that, that burn rate where you're burning just the money that's coming in. It's like, all right, okay, we're break even now, but you got to have enough runway to get there. So um, I don't know what the plan was, but I don't think that they, the new G4 was given time to succeed. I think they needed to, they needed more time to pivot and succeed and laugh at themselves. And I feel like through Attack of the Doc, the documentary, you'll be reminded of um, an era when that when that happened. So, and I hope you yeah. check it out. It's, I hope you check it out. Attack of the Doc is out. I've been doing this, I can do this all day. Attack <laughs> of the Doc is out April 24th. Uh, and it's the 21st anniversary of the launch of G4 TV. I hope you check it out on, you can buy it, rent it at vimeo.com. Go to attackofthedoc.com, doc.com. There are links there of the social media. It's all Attack of the Doc. Check it out. And the Blu-ray will be out. I know you're going to want the Blu-ray. The Blu-ray will be out in July. It's got all those unedited interviews that I know you want to check out. So 
Um, I really appreciate it, Austin. Yeah, Good talk for to sure, you. Chris. And speaking of the 21st, I know you're having an in-person Q&A at, oh gosh, where is it? The Frida um, Cinema. It's the Frida yes, Cinema. The Frida. Just go to attack attackofthedoc.com there are links you can it's one of those things like um you know i've been to a lot of movie premieres in my time been fortunate i feel very grateful but you the audience should be able to buy a ticket to a movie premiere you should just be able to buy a ticket so uh so tickets are for sale it's a limited number of tickets um it's guaranteed to sell out it might be sold out now for for as far as i know but go to attack of the dot doc.com look for that link i hope to see you at the premiere or check out the movie on the 24th yeah i'll, I'll definitely uh, check it out again on the 24th just to kind of uh, push it out again um and chris thank you so much i know we went over um uh, whatever the, yeah whatever I, I talk too much i talk too much it's part of it's it's one of the Same. skills but austin hey you're a good one you're one of the good ones out there keep doing what you're doing keep kicking ass and keep uh you know keep basically expressing your passions and uh take care thanks again i appreciate it yeah thanks so much chris thank you mm -hmm.